is he puckering the whole time? The Baldwin thing, I can't even watch like the imitation because I hate the still image of his face making the like the little kissy face or like end of the yeah. hot dog where they tie it up mouth that he does. Yeah, like, he's uh... doing. Yeah, he's doing the your face. He's doing. It's not Trump, but he's like, what would you do if I was here right now? Ha ha. Yeah. <laughs> you guys, do you know what he did at the end of the last episode? You're welcome. Oh, sh- well, yeah. Yes. He held up his hand and said, you're welcome. You're welcome. Like my, me. He honestly thinks that taking time out of his not busy schedule to be on SNL in a city he lives in anyway like, you know, uh, 10 times a year is such like an emotional sacrifice on his behalf. I feel like he did for that, that he did for us to rid us of to remind us that, in fact, the orange man was bad so that we would vote against him. I think spending even 30 seconds in Alec Baldwin's brain would drive a normal person mad. Oh, God. I don't think that I saw him one time when I was coming back from recording the dead cast. I was walking up uh, Fifth Avenue in lower Manhattan, like across the street from that movie theater around Union Square. And he was holding a toddler and he looked really mad, but he was holding the toddler in the most like it's not even a way that you would teach or not teach someone. He was holding a kid like a three year old, like it was a slice of pizza on a paper plate. <laughs> like he just had his hand flat and the kid was just sitting. His the kid's ass was here and it was like it was like a chair. David, and he uh, looked really Alec, upset. Alec Baldwin and Morrissey had the same thing happen to them where they were both like two of the hottest guys alive. And then they had that thing that happens to all Irishmen where uh, their torso just turned into a blister. Yeah. Just <laughs> their width. head got their head got really big. Uh, and uh, and for Alec Baldwin, the way to solve that was to get really into liberal politics and call his daughter a pig. And for Morrissey, <laughs> um, Morrissey actually got really good politics. Yeah. He's still what he's still working it out. But he's proof uh, that you can succeed in the um by becoming wider as you age. I was going to say, uh, with regards with regards to uh, Alec Baldwin's uh, toddler uh, holding technique, I mean, similar to a piece of pizza, if someone hands you uh, a toddler like a slice of pizza, you'll have to like uh, often hold them upside down or, or blot them with a napkin yeah. to uh, soak yep. up the excess grease that is often... The real New York way, the way yeah. we do it here, you fold, <laughs> you fold the child. In the, <laughs> yeah. In the original intro to uh, Louis... He is eating a toddler. (laughs) It was produced by the Podesta Group. (laughs) Real quick before we start, I mean, like, uh, we brought up up Nicolas Cage. Uh, Guess what movie... Uh, we watched this weekend. Uh, Catherine had never seen it. That's right. Con Air. Hell yes. One of the best action movies of the 90s. Probably, like, as you said, Matt, the best Michael Bay movie not directed by Michael Bay. And yep. I think Catherine nailed it uh, when she said, like, uh, this was, uh, Con Air is, this is the one thing we didn't want to happen, the movie. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We got all the terrifyingest criminals together on one plane, and now they're in charge. Oh, boy. It's crazy. I, like- I think that used to be a model for doing movies. Like, just, like, get some recognizable actor and then just, like, the 10 best and most engaging character actors alive and be like, yep. all right, like, at some point, you're going to be in a bus accident. Uh, we haven't figured out what else happens yet. And then just, that's like, let true. them rock. That, yeah, yeah. The, the, that's the thing about, like, that's the secret of Bay and the Bay style, of which this is the exemplar. Uh, is that one of the big things that props it up in the absence of, you know, story or plausibility or character development is the good actors, the good craggy character actors who fill out the rest of the cast. To, uh, Bay in particular gets performances like real for the rafters performances from people who checked out in every other film they've been in in 20 years. If anyone has seen The Last Night, the last Transformers movie, Sir Anthony Hopkins is in that. And if anyone has seen an Anthony Hopkins movie since like 2000, he has checked the fuck out. He is at like Robert De Niro level. And in this movie, he is like a shrieking baboon. He's like going <laughs> for the rafters. It's like, I'm assuming that this is just because Michael Bay just screams into their face with a megaphone. One way or another, it makes for engaging film. I have an idea for um, a movie like that that we can do during uh, the second year of the first Biden term. Uh, and my scenario for this movie, and like you can pick the actors, like maybe even bring back Nicolas Cage, have the guy who played uh, Chris Hansen or Robert Hansen in Breach in this movie. Chris Cooper. Yeah, Chris Cooper. Chris Cooper, yeah. 
So it would be about a giant shark that only attacks religious and ethnic minorities. And it would be about the government trying to deal with this problem and the issues that arise from it. You know that Michael Bay is producing, this for I think, Netflix next year, a movie about what if COVID became super deadly and killed like 75% of the population? Yeah, it's got the, um, it's got Archie, like yes. hot Archie from the sex yeah. Archie show. K- KJ Apa. Yep. Peter Stormare. And again, again, with the fucking Michael Bay thing, like just getting like the craziest actors and being yeah. like, the script is, is not bad. I mean, like, but it's not finished. And then you just talk about hyper normalizing things. Like, this thing is still happening and it's not stopping at all. It's like, in fact, worse than it yeah, ever was. And no one ever. has any hope that it's going to change. And they're making a movie like, yeah, but what if that thing that was, wow, that thing, what if it was worse? It's like, it's still happening, dude. Yeah. Like, you think it's Matt, like Matt, if Michael Bay ran out into, like, the fucking Plaza 9-11 with a camera and started filming the rubble and, like, turning that into the Transformers movie. Matt, like, when they, when they, when, like, when Michael Bay was pitching uh, uh, the, the, this COVID lockdown movie, he was, it was probably in, you know, March of this yeah. year. And he was like, okay, yeah. here's, here's the picture of the movie. Imagine um, nine to ten months from now, all of this shit is uh, still going on. Nothing's changed, and um, yep. we still have to deal with it. Imagine that dystopian future. Imagine that horrible reality that that could. Ha- yeah, they're trying. They were trying to make a dystopia, and it's like you undershot our ability to dystopiaize things, dude. All the the cultural products that were pitched and accepted in like spring when it th- seemed like this was at its worst are going to be like the most like the idea that Andrew Cuomo has a book about how we beat COVID. It's <laughs> yeah. like, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> in stores <laughs> now, you, you know can that, buy like, that thing. What you if, can read that like while you're in your uh, second lockdown, which is going to be what if what if you weeks. what if you like open that what if you open that book and it's just like 2019. They told me that all the nursing homes in New York were overpopulated. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's but, true. but like, I had a solution. You know what it's like? It's the strange discordance of culture that's that's coming out now. Shit that was greenlit one to two years ago and timed for the election. Like they thought the Comey rule would be this, you know, this big triumphant TV event to coincide with Biden getting elected president. So we've already talked about breach, and you just brought up the Comey rule. Can we do a Billy Ray like appreciation? Shattered glass. Here? Because I kind of, so I watch some of the Comey Rule because I'm a fucking pervert and also because I can't see my friends anymore. Uh, so it's just, it's, TV is, it's one of my closest buddies now. We bond over whatever it you shows can see me. your friends, uh, Mueller, Jim Comey, the lady. Uh, all of, who yeah, so this is, yeah. All of your friends right there on. I consider them more Lovely like heroes or mighty minor gods. Well, all the people that Trump like whines about are in the movie, like T.R. Knight from, uh, the early Grey's Anatomy. Yeah, Grey's Anatomy. But he plays like Peter Stroke or like somebody that I've known as like a punchline from like tweets where they're like the lovely <laughs> Miss Lisa and like all of Trump's people know who that is. And I'm like, was that like Macho Man Randy <laughs> Savage's girlfriend? Like, I don't remember <laughs> who you're talking about. But so I watched the some lovely of, Lisa Page. <laughs> so Comey Rule is like 75%. It's watchable in the way that all Billy Ray movies are where it's like just people that look uh, tired in like <laughs> prop ceiling sets in DC, like being upset with each other. The Brendan Gleeson performance as Trump in that is fantastic. It's so good. I loved it. It's so like good. I don't yeah. recommend watching the rest of the series, but he is a monster. Yeah, horrifying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like yeah. And, and they really want to get at like the fact that his Trump's imposition into the world of of DC is really one of manners. It is he is a grotesque figure. It is really like Caddyshack. I mean, we yeah. said that like four years ago, but this is essentially a dramatic remake of Caddyshack. And, and he is uh, he's uh, he's Rodney Dangerfield showing up at Bushwood. This whole place sucks. That's right, it sucks. Only reason I'm here is maybe I'll buy it. And so they have to like emphasize the physical grotesqueness of Trump. And he just gets it with the breathing. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. It's all, it's the same oh, thing with yeah. the, uh, like, all the best imitations. Like, basically, I, I mean, the, the famous, like, the interview uh, with the James, uh, James Austin Johnson. I'm forgetting his name. The guy that's, like, the king. Yes, that's it. Yes. Where he was, like, yeah, you have to, like, get a lot of mucus in there. And, like, I like to get my glottis swollen. Like, you have to, like, <laughs> physically get sick to do yeah, a good you Trump imitation. Yourself, yeah. You have to, like, drink, if, drink a lot of milk right beforehand. <laughs> that, get a that, nice uh, phlegmy yeah. throat. That's what I thought about, like, when it, like, thinking about, like, physically being Donald Trump. It's like, he's probably had what's felt like a low-level cold for 40 years. Oh, yeah. Like, he, yeah, just horror. 
Like, he just wakes up every day with, like, a sodium-induced headache. Yep. <laughs> and, like, just some type of congestion. Like, and I always thought, you know, they do it in the movie, but I always thought about this when Trump, like, made Comey take that picture with him. I was like, what does it feel like to, like, pat the back of Donald Trump? Oh, God. Yeah. So, <laughs> oh, I just imagine like, he's he's personally clammy and yet somehow covered in baby powder. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, I feel like it's a weird combination of, like, softness that shouldn't be there yep. some weird things that are hard not hard like a bone but hard like congealed fat yeah, yeah. And, and like there are certain scents that are way too minty oh god <laughs> yeah yeah Ugh. like strange all this because all the shit that he uses for like grooming or for like freshening his breath is like discontinued 80s products like he has like <laughs> a like a storage facility full of like the like pale like blue tic tacs that they like stop <laughs> being able to sell when like george hw bush was president and yeah, but I feel like Trump definitely would have like a like a wet laundry feel, and not like <laughs> yeah, the dryer, yeah, but like bag, yeah. washer the washer to dryer segment of laundry yeah. is what you're dealing with there. Yes. Okay. Uh, welcome. It's Chop. Everybody, in case you haven't figured it out already, it's uh, me, Will, here with Matt, Felix, and Virgil, and joining us today is longtime fan favorite uh, David Roth. David, how's it going? I'm good, man. How are you? Uh, we're doing, we're all doing good. Um, you know, I guess we wanted to, to have you on and check in because you know we're uh, we're working hard now to stop the steal. Every show now we're doing is about stopping the steal. Um, That's great, man. That's all you the, can do. Supporting the million MAGA march and just that we all know that like, look, Trump is going to be inaugurated in January. I mean, like, do you honestly think that Trump didn't have a plan for this? Do you honestly think there's not a plan in motion right you, now? You have to yeah. hashtag trust the plan. Have not you been this paying stuff attention? Coming. Yeah. See, I've been like the, watching the transition from Q to E has been really exciting <laughs> for me just to see the next stage of where this is all uh, actually going. Um, do you all know about the the E thing? This is I, a real I think it's about, thing. It's like, E from it, Entourage is, no, is no, taking over from Q? It's Mark it's, Esper, right? It is, no, it's supposed to be Ezra Cohen Watnick. Who's like some oh, that loyal? Guy. Again, it's another what? like <laughs> like a Peter Stroke, Lisa Page level dude, where like only the real heads know about Ezra Cohen Watnick from Vampire and, Weekend. Yeah, yeah, this, <laughs> yeah, he's yeah he's changed a lot in the past couple of years. Ezra Cohen Watnick is like he's a, a DOD swamp creature. He's the protege of Michael Adine, who's an Iran hawk and gladiator. Oh, that dude. guy. Oh, well, yeah. wait a minute. I, I'm confused. I thought these guys were defeating the uh, the the swamp monster of intervention. Well, it's like a vaccine. You have to inject a little bit of gladio yeah. in your ah, blood right. to beat gladio. It seems like you need to get <laughs> yeah. up to speed on the white hat, black hat dynamic that oh, exists right, in yeah. the psychotic like, like mind has, realms. Yeah. Trump has to do a little bit of pedophilia right. <laughs> to get himself in with the other pedophiles. Yeah, it's like how sometimes if you're deep cover uh, like with a criminal organization, you might have to like shoot heroin to show them you're not a cop. It's true. It's the same thing for Trump with adrenochrome. Yep. I mean, there's just been like a reshuffling of tons of guys in the cabinet since after the election. Uh, the guy they had replaced Esper on his first day walking into the Pentagon, he checked if his fly was open in front of everyone and then tripped over the steps <laughs> to the Pentagon. <laughs> it's like on video. It's I, like, love, I love just metaphor being murdered in front of me. It's every incredible. Day. Well, it's, yeah. they're definitely down. It's like a full employment plan for anyone that's ever said anything nice about Trump on Twitter now. Like they're going to like hire Jack Del Rio away from the Washington football team to like spend <laughs> three weeks running the FBI just because Absolutely. he's been very supportive. Tito Ortiz uh, just got elected to elected official city council, and he's going to have like a week where he can be secretary of state, which is great. Representing the uh... well, I mean, I mean, this is the question that, you know, uh, we're we're considering today is, you know, uh, what what now for Trump? You know, uh, I I think we're I think we're already sort of a little bit starting to miss him, you know, missing our boy. And I'm already feeling it. You know, I already feel it like I actually saw someone. Uh, they did a side by side. I think this is one of those uh, that guy Aaron Rupar, one of those like resistance dudes who just tweets about how terrible Trump is all the time. Basically, Margaret Dumont getting the pies in the face every day by the horror of Trump. <laughs> uh, and he did a side by side of the uh, of of Trump and Biden responding to the announcement of the shuttle that went up or whatever the fuck happened. The, the, yeah, the space SpaceX bullshit. launch. Yeah, it was a NASA oh, wonderful. SpaCex launch. Oh, don't yeah, you love night. a good yeah. private, private partnership? <laughs> yeah. When we don't. Yeah. And Trump uh, re- replied, he said, when I got it, 
NASA was a washed up dump. Now it's <laughs> the hot. hottest. It's the hottest, the hottest aerospace hub. And next to that was Tr- Biden going, today's uh, uh, momentous event is a tribute to both the, pri- uh, the public spirit of NASA as well as the private people. <laughs> yeah. and, go- and congratulations to the pe- And he said, Compare and contrast, as though we're supposed to read that and not think, yeah, one of these guys is hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one I mean, of these that, guys is cool, and one of these guys is a fucking square. Well, this guy just, that, made, he just literally said, not hot, Graydon Carter's Oscar parties. I know. Hot NASA, thanks to me. Barack it's Obama's old. failing NASA program has a problem. <laughs> its shuttle program is no longer hot. <laughs> I, I think, like, Biden. I think Biden himself is incredibly funny, but the problem is we're never going to see actual. Yes, because he's not yeah. going to be tweeting it all day. He's not, yeah, not going to be his like his central nervous system is not going to be wired to the Internet. Well, we're going to get more of the the Reagan thing where the president's clearly declining and a puppet of others. But uh, he's also fully aware of himself and his role as a puppet. And so he's going to hit his marks, keep his mouth shut, let them, you know, we lead him around and, and feed him juice boxes to keep him quiet. And we're never going to get just his minute by moment uh, 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 ego just exploding out yeah. into the cosmos. It's it's going to be, but when he is funny, it's going to be very funny as yeah, well. Yeah, because it's going to be because it'll be like, more concentrated. Take, take like a weird Blarney break during them. Although he won't break with the script the way that Trump does. Like Trump yeah. always needs to add like a little actorly bit of business to every <laughs> script that he's given to like yeah. nearly make it pop. Which is why he'll like. The best moments to me at the end uh, from the rallies were when he'd be talking about something that, you know, just like deep Trumpiana, like weird enemies list stuff or like a time that like Lonnie Anderson like winked at him and it definitely wasn't an accident or something like that. (laughs) And then he would have to hit the transition back to the script at the end of it. And he'd be like, so that's definitely one of the reasons why we're making sure that the border is not like just a place where anybody can drive across Lonnie uh, Anderson would have understood that of course <laughs> but like you have to try to like steer back off the like out of the gulch and back onto the road whereas Trump yeah, will never he, or Biden will never leave the road yeah he's he's I think about my favorite Trump performance is what he pretended not to know that Ruth Bader Ginsburg died and he put <laughs> he like closed his eyes very theatrically that was like Biden will never do stuff like that but all Biden's funny shit is when he's in reverie of something that happened 60 years yeah, ago. Yeah, or, he gets to the or, yeah, reverie loop. Or when he has, like, a dementia explosion and turns into Betty Draper's dad when <laughs> anyone asks him a tough question. Oh, yes. Like, yeah. yes. Why, 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 man? <laughs> like, that was Hold on awesome. now, you slap-happy jackal. <laughs> like, he, everyone forgot this, but, like, he did say, look, fat. And yeah. challenge the guy to a push-up contest. That rule. Like, that was awesome. That was that amazing. Was awesome. There was a period of time where oh, I thought that was going to be his strategy against Trump. Yeah. Where they, he would, like, in the debates, that, like, Trump would get up there and be like, I've owned every type of car, like, in all the different colors that you can have it. And then Biden would be like, I, I would love to see you try to do a chin-up. And that would just be, it would be like grandpa fights. I expected that because it was like, that stuff, people actually like that stuff. Like, if you watch the- That's why they didn't do it. Yeah. yeah. If you watch the look fat video, it's like a it's like everyone in that crowd is just a completely stationary octo- octogenarian. <laughs> and when Biden goes, listen, look, look, fat, you want to do a push up right now, <laughs> man? Uh, they, they're just like humming in approval. They're like bees. Yeah, they love. They're them. just like, <laughs> <laughs> but that's it. the thing is that but, the Democrats, because they're the party of the superego, they have to turn away from all that works, like works at a political level and, and turn it into an abstraction. They have to turn it into those like, no, I'm going to be the center of decency for the good, uh, the good middle-class people who, who want yeah. everyone to turn down the volume. Because no one agreed. Yeah. No one agreed. No one, no one agreed with me on this. But that first Biden Trump debate, I thought like I think one of the reasons it was so close may have been that debate. Like they should have had Biden call Trump fat at that debate, and instead he would he was just like, <laughs> "You're a nincompoop, buddy." I mean, like it possible. sucked. He could have like totally out. He could have tried to out alpha Trump, and that could have actually just thrown the whole thing into a into a tizzy i think that's possible yeah but yeah, uh, he was watching that jeb bush game tape yep kind of yeah. the right way to chortle at him because well, these guys are all last year's model like the people the person who's going to defeat trump is not going to come from within the political order that he overturned you know what i mean like it's going to come from uh uh it's going to come from something that emerges 
after it and in response to it. Well, as long as you're talking about um, uh, things things that work for Trump, uh, I'd like to I'd like to talk briefly on just like you know where he's at now with these like series of lawsuits. Because I mean, like uh, over the weekend, he referred to Biden as president elect. Or he's no, he didn't say president elect. He said Biden won the election because of X, Y, and Z. And then everyone was like, oh, he's conceding. And then he just showed up 90 minutes later to be like, I'm not conceding anything. I won the election. So, I mean, he, he, he's still going forward with that. They had the, the sort of the million MAGA march in, in D.C. this weekend. But I'm just interested in these in these lawsuits in uh, the, these states where he's seeking to overturn uh, the results from. And I was wondering if someone can explain this to me, because, like, as best I can understand it, even if these lawsuits were are allowed to proceed by a judge or like if they prevail in court, you're still like, what is being alleged is still talking about like a, a number of votes that even if they were all declared fraudulent would not come close to overturning the results right. in any right. of these states. Yeah. Right. But yeah. what I'm hearing now, although like uh, what like a lot of these people seem to be suggesting or hinting at, is this idea that. The Republican governors of these states can appoint their own electors to the Electoral College who will then vote mm. for Trump in opposition to the... It's not the governors, it's the, it's the legislatures. State legislatures. State yeah. legislatures. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so state legislatures can appoint their own electors to the Electoral College, which is right. like... Yeah. That was the original uh, way it worked to the Constitution. I actually remember this particular rationalization from 2016. Too, yep, though. faithless electors. Like, yeah. they have to stop this. They have and to take... The, they have to think of what's best for the country and stop this. As I recall, there was like a letter writing campaign and then the one faithless elector was like a Democrat that voted for Trump. Like he got like <laughs> yep. one more electoral yeah, yeah. vote than he was supposed to. There was to. an SNL sketch where Hillary Clinton re, uh, played the uh, guy in Love Actually with the yeah. with the uh, with the oh uh, the cards, the like the, cards? the Bob Dylan yeah. kind of thing. And it was in front of an elector's house. And she was like making the pitch for her to. You know, just vote for Hillary because, come on, Trump's crazy. But I, I mean, see like, the joke there. But I just like just there, specifically there, though, like, uh, is this a thing that could have that, that no, works? No, 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 it's not going to happen. I mean, I mean, like in, in 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 Michigan, they already said like, no, we're not doing that but, like, shit. Uh, wouldn't, and, it, wouldn't it like if if they do sub in new new electors to the electoral college, don't they by default have to vote for the winner of the popular no, vote? No, no, no. It's, it's the question. The question. The, there's two different questions here. Will it happen? The answer is no. Could it happen? Is there is there a legal theory behind it? Yes, absolutely. Right. Uh, according well, to a according to a congressional according to the congressional statute from the 19th century that governs all of this shit, the state legislatures are empowered to appoint their own slate of electors in the event of a bad election. What that means is not has not is not defined by statute. So theoretically, you could take the Republican, uh, you know, they have a huge uh, Republican legislature in Pennsylvania. They have a huge majority there because of gerrymandering. Uh, they could say, OK, well, this election was fraudulent. You know, it's a bad election. We reject all the results. We're just going to pick the electors ourselves and we're going to pick Trump electors and then send those to Congress. And then the conflict, yeah. what the conflict would be. But the thing is, the conflict would be uh, the governor of Pennsylvania, who's a Democrat, will no matter what certify the election for Biden and then send his set, uh, slate of electors. So to it's two electors that it would show becomes, up. Comes, yeah. And that's a classic sitcom premise right there. Two yeah. sets of electors show up for the same state. It's nice to know that episodes of Three's Company were a good preparation for figuring out what would happen in the 2020 election. But like some scenario where uh, John Ritter is trying to get somebody to hide in the bathroom. That's basically how you choose a president. <laughs> and I believe in that case, wouldn't it then be, I mean, all right, so if they can't figure out if that doesn't work either way, it it goes to the House of Representatives. But two sets of electors from each state, some of these states show up. Who, who then yeah. decides which one is to be recorded? So that's where it gets very complicated. Basically, the statute doesn't explain that. It's up to Congress to suss it out. Oh, okay. So in this case, then Congress would just. But basically, here's here's what would happen. Here's what would happen. Uh, I my guess is by default the electors appointed by the democrat governor you know properly certified uh those are the ones that would end up getting submitted to uh the the floor of congress uh during the joint session on january 6 when they uh count the electoral votes and then it would be up to the republicans one at least one in the house and one in the senate to object to those electors then both houses they separate and they they debate the objection for up to 2 hours and then they vote on it uh, what complicates things, of course, is that no matter what 
happens in the Georgia special elections, Republicans will continue to uh, control the Senate in that special session because Mike Pence, you know, is still vice president. He'll still preside over it. Uh, the open question is, what happens if the House says, well, you know, no, this is a frivolous objection. You know, we accept the Biden electors. And the Senate says we accept the objection. No, there is there is well, no, so, I mean, you know, there's there's no guidance from well, either it, uh, precedent or, well, wouldn't you know, getting, the letter wouldn't of law. Wouldn't getting to that particular point be like basically the legal strategy of Trump and his campaign? Because don't they want more than anything the Supreme Court to decide this? Basically, yeah. I mean, as much you know, because he lost the election is the thing. So all he can really do is gum up the works and create as much chaos and you know use the the uh, the outmoded nature of this system, the the Byzantine nature of it, to find entry points in which they could you know maybe tip the yeah. scales in their favor. But again, this is very very extreme. Uh, it won't happen because this would require to actually get to this point would require a level of coordination. Yeah, that's that what just I was gonna doesn't say. Exist. Like, this is definitely one of those things where like Trump's natural instinct to just like stay up for three straight days complaining online, like kind of almost looks like it could like militate towards a specific end that's like, you know, reasoned and like has this, you know, sort of a linear process. But like it certainly does not like no. everything that we know about him is that like he just doesn't want to go to bed. That's like yeah, the bottom yeah, line. Yeah, with the guy I'm, always. He's fussy. I'm uh, I'm thinking about the timeline of this, and it's like immediately after the election, there was just radio silence from the National Republican Party. And people, a lot of people just uh, interpreted it as them selling out Trump. But what I think it actually was, was they were waiting for whatever dumb shit he was going to come up with that they would then run. with. Yeah, that's been the whole and, uh, that's yeah. their job. I mean, that's what but it's the, been yeah. for four years anyway. But. Yeah, but that shows me like that makes me very not afraid of the prospect of this because it means it's like, oh, they had no plan for this. They had no James Baker on deck. They had no like legal processes on deck. They were just like, OK, like everything has been so whittled down and everything is such a bad photocopy of a bad photocopy that instead of a uh, a plan that they were going to come up with three years ago for this. They were like, all right, let's see what he complains <laughs> yeah. about. And then what he complains about, we'll agree with. And then hopefully it, the judge likes us. All they could they do, don't. all they could do ever was hope to get an outcome that could be swayable by their intervention in it. And they were all imagining, like everybody does, every general fights the last war. They were imagining a Bush versus Gore situation mm -hmm. where you've got one case, yeah. you've got one batch of votes. You've got, and even better, you are like uh, already declared the winner. Huh. And like you're intervening to stop uh, a winner from like being that call for being reversed, and then that coming to one court case. This is this is 15 fucking states or whatever, and state legislators, and you're this is a Rube Goldberg contraption, and it's necessitated because he didn't have the he didn't it wasn't close enough. Yeah, he didn't do good enough. It's just I mean, that he didn't do good enough for them to have done, and so it doesn't like a smart guy with self respect would recognize that and not try anyway. But because Trump is just operating from pure basal instinct of I'm not owned, he is going to activate it. He's going to hit the domino thing over and start the chain reaction of like, you know, among his flunkies and uh, media suckers and dipshits who all are like working towards the Fuhrer and their little, you know, pathetic uh, uh, marquee level marketing scheme Ponzi ass way. But they're not going to actually be able to do anything because the position doesn't exist where they can intervene. Yeah, I think that's no, also right, right. like the reason that. I mean, the other thing that we're leaving out of this is that, like, the the reason that Bush v. Gore worked is that the Republicans had just, like, this fucking crack A-team of vampires who, like, yeah. know how to win and know how to, like, go to court. And I think if this had been closer, it wouldn't have been a problem to get, like, Ted Olson or, like, somehow Jim Baker is still alive. Yeah. So, like, yeah. whatever, like, that, whatever exquisite corpse, like, wandering into a courtroom and, like... If they could have won it, those guys would have done it. I don't think that right. it's like they're not that offended by Trump that they're going to let. Right, right, right. No, but yeah, it yeah. wasn't close enough. So they're not going to embarrass themselves for him. The Bush v. Gore people had an A team that uh, grinded their skills in the bullpen of the Iran contract yeah. cover up. Like I mean, the well, worst yeah. people that their <laughs> generation Trump, produced. Trump has people who like tried to defraud a federal court in a little Lestra class action. <laughs> no, which was so great to see after the election, too. And there, there was one story that was like Jared Kushner's looking around for a Jim Baker type. 
And I just yeah. thought of him like being on LinkedIn, like searching for everybody that has Svengali and they're like as a job that they've had in the past. Like there's you don't like they find you, man. Like it's not somebody that's in your Rolodex that you can just call and be like, this was my dad's tax attorney. And like he was so good at tennis. Yeah. Like that's, well, that's not, the thing. Get Trump, you the, 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 the only guy they have like that who was a deep state soldier and Iran Contra veteran is Bill Barr. And Bill Barr's entire job is to like uh, unseal testimony about Nellie Orr. Yeah. That's what they put him in charge of. There is a a Felix tweet. This may have been from like a deleted account even from back in the day where you said that Trump's lawyers, like his response to everything is to like get mad and then have his lawyer write a letter saying that he's normal. Like that is basically (laughs) Bill Barr is now the guy writing the like Trump is normal letters. Yeah. So Biden won by Biden won the Electoral College by 36 electoral votes so for trump to prevail he would have to overturn the you know actual results in at least three of the closest states and granted these states were very close you know Biden's margin of victory in these states less than one percent this was a pretty close election actually in terms of the states much like 2016 was uh and like one of the things that's hindering the trump campaign overall is they, there's no coherent legal argument being made and there's no you know sole remedy being requested from the courts in bush v gore bush had a very simple legal strategy stop the count stop the recount i won yeah. stop the recount that's it run out the clock which they did this time around it's no no, no. do the recount in georgia do the recount in arizona right. but stop counting in pennsylvania and throw out these votes in wisconsin and throw out these votes and it's like what what would that even do you know if, if all those cases were merged and just dumped at the supreme court what would they even do with it just say oh yeah fine you win the reason you have a guy like John Roberts in the position he is in is to recognize the lay of the land and, and realize what is a, a crucial goal and what is a short term one that can be sacrificed. And there would be no clearer fucking example of when to cut bait than on that. Yeah. And yeah. to try to force that f- through on behalf of a guy who is only representative of a personal cult like these guys. There is no Trump project beyond his ego like that in a real sense. He is not ideological. It is purely about his own ego gratification and his own self-dealing. And it's like that corresponds to a lot of Republican uh, strategies for many reasons. But if there's a conflict and the conflict between keeping this guy at the expense of like having to break an entire like, you know, uh, uh, legal framework that has allowed for the relatively safe uh, exultion of social pressures away from political action for the entirety of American history, we're just going to junk that on behalf of this guy. Who is the, who, the who crying have to, fat man? Yeah, and we, we now all have to devote ourselves <laughs> yeah. to just anticipating every colicky fart he comes out of his mouth, or else we're going to get fired, and and everyone is and, and all of his hooting idiot fans are going to think that we're pedophiles. Yeah, because he because we like had a fucking gravy stain on our tie once when he we he saw us at lunch. Yeah, and you also have to imagine that the Senate results are also impacting the the you know the the conservative justices' views on this matter. Uh, because a, a, a 50-50 Senate, which is the best the Democrats could do, where Joe Manchin holds the uh, uh, balance of power there under a Biden administration, that's no threat to the conservative no, judiciary at all. That's, that's, that's fine. They're not going to pack the court. Maybe if it had been, you know, like, I don't know, Democrats just win 58 seats and they say, fuck yeah, we're doing court packing the day after the election, maybe that would change the calculus yes. a little bit. Oh, my God. They're on a glide path to wiping out uh, to expanding the massively expanding their Senate lead and f- retaking the House in 2022, and then easily defeating the Democrats in 2024. Yes. Why the hell would they do this on Trump's behalf? Yeah. If you if they stole the election for Trump now, that makes it that is the most difficult path to a Republican being in power ten years from now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Like that's that's it. Why would you like, destabilize anything? Why would you risk anything for this result when you but, can hold yeah. back and maybe get something that's less of a pain in the ass to deal with? Because like Trump had his benefits, but he also was a fucking he was he is because of his personal psychosis, a actual impediment to like the smooth functioning of systems. And the, the people who try to like squint at Trump and see him as like a threat to capitalism, it, they are recognizing mm-hmm. that his specific neuroses and the way that it color his approach to governing means that he actually can get in the way of business as usual sometimes but what that means is that the republican party has no personal loyalty to him and will spit him out at the first convenience i think they would i mean 
I wonder in some ways if they're not afraid of him enough at this point, because I think he's going to be very annoying for them over the next few elections. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. It, and, and I think that that, it, you know, whatever, he's an unstable and like, you know, in his way, a very dangerous guy. Like, it's hard to predict what he's going to do. But I, I definitely do get the sense that they're like, they absolutely would have gone to the wall for him if he had given them a chance to do it. But in this case, yeah. it's like, it's throwing good money after bad. Like, yeah. And he's still going to be, you know, a, Abs- I mean, like, whatever, this is who he is. He's going to be a bitch about it and he's going to complain. He's going to identify people he thought weren't loyal enough. And then he's going to show up in some city in their state and tell a story about like the time that he and Jimmy Connors were like flirting with Suzanne Summers at the same time or something like that. And that'll be him. That's like what he does. Yeah. And he might very well, you know, like candidates that are more like him might wind up primarying people that weren't loyal enough to him. And I'm sure that would be very annoying for everybody. But like, not as annoying it would as be having like to the, sublimate your entire project to this guy's gratification, mm, which they did. Would, there wasn't even a fucking platform. Yep. No, no platform. This year. It was just, we support Trump's agenda. They like, even that- if, if Trump in exile is like a media figure who, yes, becomes a center for political gravity and creates like a, a, like many people who, who like run in primaries uh, against establishment Republicans, yes, that's annoying and it would, it would be a hindrance. But it would be absorbed the same way the Tea Party was. Mm-hmm. Like, the Tea Party took over the party, really, but then that's just because they merged at the top and, like, it stabilized. Uh, and, you like, a guy like Marco Rubio came in as a Tea Party firebrand. It's like they didn't sell out. The party did move right, you know? Like, it, it, it is doing the capillary action of pushing the party to the right. And the Trump, uh, Trump like, I think on cultural grounds, certainly, uh, would push the party right in that direction. But other than that, it would just be absorbing it would be absorbed into the republican party in general and yeah. their benefit his no, I mean, impact I, on the party mm-hmm. is going to be stylistic because there's no yes. ideology to speak exactly, of and you yes. can see the stylistic element already it's just like what you're gonna get is more like of the like madison cawthorn like these like really yes like mutant creatures right because the alternative is like all these like 75 year old former <laughs> attorneys that are like in the senate having to go up there and be like cry more libs and like just like that's the politics they are they can't do that they have no they don't have they don't have swag yeah and man. like the thing is like it's easy to say oh you lost you suck and it is funny that the god emperor lost to probably the most mentally uh, decimated <laughs> Democrat. It is insanely funny. It, it's uh, insane. I, mentioned, I, I, I well, remind Felix, myself of it every day. But, but, it's the funniest Felix, just thing. A, a, it's, like, it's, it's, like if, it's, it's like if uh, Woodrow Wilson had run for re-election in 1920. Yeah, yep. exactly. <laughs> exactly. But but uh, the other thing that Democrats should take note of, and yes, oh, he won by three million votes. Oh, that's a lot. Um, This was record turnout. And Donald yeah. Trump made it within three million votes. Yeah. That's not supposed to happen with Republicans. And, and, no, and more turnout most... is supposed to kill them. That's what I thought. Yeah. Yeah. And, but it and, turns yeah. out his appeal, it's transcendent of, of all the narrow categories that you're imposing on people who aren't you and assuming exist in them the way they do in you. And I know a lot but of people, like... myself included, have said that if it wasn't for COVID, Trump would have uh, you know, easily won re-election, which is a little like saying, you know, how, how, was the, how was the play, Mrs. Lincoln? I mean, COVID did happen, right. so it's a little hard to. But an addendum to that should be, I totally believe if Trump had just managed to cut one more check before the election, he yes. would maybe yes. not been yeah. guaranteed to have yeah. win, but would have been gotten way close. I mean, it would have been way, oh, for way sure. nicer. For sure. If all, the, yeah. Biden, the Biden coalition is one of the most fragile, shitty coalitions oh my I've God. ever seen a Such Democrat win shit. with. Awful. It's incredibly fragile. It's fragile to the point that if you had somebody who got the Trump seal of approval who people hated 10% less, they stomp him. Yep. They fucking stomp him. These Biden's voters, the people that swayed the election for Biden, these hoes are not loyal. They split their tickets and they voted Republican down ticket because they want to keep their taxes low. They haven't bought into any any notions beyond propriety. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So as soon as well, Trump what is what there, did Biden fucking run on beyond there, propriety, though? That was no? it. And yeah. no, that was the idea. They they got the coalition they wanted. It's just that what they want is it's, it's suicide. They just don't realize. Well, yeah, I mean, like, yeah, yeah. half of Biden and, voters and voted how... for, against Trump, not for Biden. And yeah. without Trump there, I mean, within politics, like he'll be there as a carnival barker from the sideline, but that'll give them permission to ignore him if they want to. And then within like the parameters of re- respectable politics, 
uh, there's not going to be a Trump there to discipline them, and they're going to reassert their class interests. And that means, and 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 the Democrats will have nothing to show for their their lurch towards the suburban yeah, uh, and voters. And, and and if I mean, like as an example of how how fragile the Biden coalition is, is that like it didn't take. It took about an hour after the networks officially <laughs> called it for Biden for every part of that coalition to immediately start fucking yelling at each other about who gets to take credit for him winning. Yep. And I'm sorry, mm -hmm. if you're on the left or the progressive side of the Democratic Party, I'd fucking pipe down. I mean, I understand like there, there's a certain fairness or hypocrisy to the way you're being attacked, but I'd pipe down about taking credit for this one. Because, I mean, yes. think about where the next four years are going to go. Are you really going to want... You don't want... If yeah. you're from, like, the Justice Democrat side of the party, do you really want the narrative to be right now that we were the decisive factor in electing mm -hmm. Joe mm -hmm. Biden? In installing Joe Biden? Yeah. Well, I mean, the yeah. story that they want to tell now is, you know, about what's next, right? About the idea of the the famous moving him left idea. Or yeah. I mean, I think the, that, like, ideologically, Joe Biden is not moving because ideologically, Joe Biden is, like... It's like when like Homer Simpson has like a dream sequence and it's just like a cow playing like a, a song on a jug. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Do you know the image? It's not a podcast or in a visual medium. Yeah. I'm struggling here, but the yeah. we all all our listeners immediately know that image, David. Yeah, oh, good. We know right, what you're cool. talking about. Actually, it's why we love them. Uh, but the so like that that's not there's no ideal ideology to speak of. I think that if you push Biden in the direct direction of like some version of material politics like obviously we're not gonna he's not gonna do medicare for all or whatever because he's scared of it and he's it's just a whip dog after 45 years of being a democrat in a republican dominated political scene i do think that stuff like the you know canceling student debt and the raising the minimum wage it's not perfect obviously there's like but i think that that's the sort of politics that you can maybe nudge biden on because of the fact that it's like it's simple you can take credit for it and it can be spun in the ways these like losing ways the Democrats have always pitched stuff like that, which is like, you know, like kitchen table families or whatever, just some one of those junior jumble phrases. they throw How is that going to happen with a Republican Senate or a 50 50? I mean, the, the student debt is executive order. Yeah, but he's not going to. But have Biden no has no appetite to, to go around Congress. He's even if he does have the uh, prerogative to do that. He's not going to. He's going to say, you know what? We're going to we got to work out a deal if we're yeah, going to do something like, like cut that. Cut a deal with James I would Langford be. Sure. I'm not writing it down. Amount. Yeah, I'm not writing it off. Uh, but I think it's a pretty slim chance. I would be. I would be surprised. And if it, if you do get it, very focused and very astute. And I have never seen him be either of those things. I don't think. Like I definitely. 2000. I don't see him taking the the Schumer suggestion of writing off fifty thousand dollars of everyone's student debt. And if there was a debt write off. Uh, I feel like it would be like ten thousand dollars and come with all these weird Kamala Harris type. Uh, was that what they were talking about today? That it was that it was initially going to be ten, like fifty, and now he's like more comfortable with ten it's, because it's going to be some it's this theater of rebate. negotiating with yourself RB's and losing fucking coupons. Yeah, it's going to be. You um, know, and he never promised this. Off your next fifty dollars off your next college. Credit, correct me if I'm right? wrong, but <laughs> yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, but he did not promise this. This was not something no, in their agenda no, before no, the election. No. Floating. Which Anytime I see do, stuff like that, things. I am I just think about how cool it would be to be there for the moment when Joe Biden finds out that people are talking about this. Because I, I feel like he doesn't necessarily know, <laughs> but at some point this is no. going to land and he's going to be like, I'm sorry, you told people I would do what? When like, I'm Joe not Biden realizes those sounds he's hearing are people uh, around him talking, Yeah, <laughs> it's going to be real I mean, fascinating. I, I would say that if he does it, if he does do any significant student loan forgiveness, it is not it is going to be not because of any pressure from below, but because it is the agreed upon choice among whatever gaggle of techno uh, technocrat ghouls that he surrounds himself with, that it's the most effective form of economic stimulus that they can short uh, apply yeah. like quickly to the economy. Yeah, because they are like everyone recognizes that this is an unsustainable economic system right now. Mm -hmm. it, it, there has to be some massive injection of money into the demand sector, or this entire thing is going to fucking spin off the wheels. So there's going to have to be a huge, huge amount of Keynesian stimulus into the fucking economy, and that's a quick way to do a lot of it. Or at least that's what they're going to think. And because well, they're, they're going to do it, it the like, Democrat it isn't genuinely, way, though, it, it's like. not genuinely like a redistributive, you know, and it's not uh, and it's not something that has to go through Congress. It's something that they could turn a key and do the way that all the stuff in fucking the AMA 
or the uh, the uh, first uh, bailout from Obama, like two thirds of that was fucking tax cuts. And they designed it for that too. They wanted it to be clever so people wouldn't know that they were getting more money back. And this of like- feels like that, like because the easy answer to how do you do Keynesian stimulus in the system is just give people a ton of money, but give everybody money i don't know yeah uh, that's, skin in the game a lot of those people and this and this gets into the way like the, the the biden coalition is cutting each other's throats right now the problem with giving everyone money is that some of those everybody's are bad people who voted for Trump. it's true they're bad and then, people. Yeah. And then like that, 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 that as you, we've talked about before in the past man like politics is about you know who's who has to suffer and you know for a good chunk of the biden coalition the idea that uh the the suffering of uh you know of of racist white you know trump voting people would be ameliorated in any way rather than actively increased is anathema to uh, you want to give you want to you want to give everyone money don't you realize some people are ne'er do wells <laughs> yeah instead but, uh, like you could, literally I never going to do well why you would you re- give them money yeah you're going to you, you, you want to get <laughs> roused about some money yeah <laughs> instead think, how about you reward the people who did the the self-improving act of like going to college maybe and figuring out how to be good people. Maybe they should be rewarded for that. Well, I do wonder if I don't think that they could possibly do it as badly as they did in 2008 and 2009 though, or 2009. No. I mean, that stimulus well, like I, I, it would I, be really that. difficult if anyone I wanna, I wanna, could like it's these guys yes but the idea of burying that stimulus in such a way that people don't even know i mean it's like you don't want well, to aspire to anything trump like but him sending people like a fucking debit card with a note that says like don't spend it all in one place donald J. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's a lot, well, that's all a lot depends smarter on what, what de- all depends on what the economic picture is going to be in february it depends on what covid is going to look like in february well, because we know that what needs to happen right now what should have happened you know fucking yesterday Yesterday or six months ago is you just have to give people people money to fucking stay home that's it period end of sense yeah. that's the only thing you can possibly do forget yeah. not even thinking about yes. not even thinking about uh, you know like trying to keep the economy flow not even thinking about it as a, as a Keynesian injection as helicopter money but just straight up no this has to happen or else deaths yeah that's the thing it's like mm-hmm. this these are not mere calculations it's like keeping people home literally is a first order solution to the problem of rampaging pandemic disease I mean, I want to, I want to, I want to switch you. I mean, because we are talking about like looking forward to a Biden administration and, and what the Democrats are going to be like. And, you know, we, we've talked before, we've discussed uh, earlier on in this show that like the Republican Party is now basically a personality cult about Donald Trump. Like the Republican yeah. voters are yeah. in the bag for Trump 100%. Trump is probably never going to concede. He is most likely going to become some sort of TV personality or anti president who will just sort of like give his own State of the Union address or fucking, uh, you know, be, be sworn in at Mar a Lago and he'll just be sort of this, <laughs> this, 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 this alternate presidency. And that, like, you know, the Republican, the Republican Party is going to have to. Uh, indulge that because their voters love Donald Trump and trust him more than any other politician who's maybe ever lived. The Democrats, however, if that is the case with the Republican Party, we've said it before, I'll say it again now, are free to live their dream, which is govern as a Republican Party of maybe 10 or 20 years ago yeah. would be. And to, to, to that end, I just want to give uh, just, just, just check in briefly on this interview that Barack Obama gave to Jeffrey Goldberg, because let's be honest. Oof. The Democratic Party is Barack Obama's party. He's in charge oh, yeah. of it. He's in charge 100%. of it. It's not, it's not Biden's party. Barack no, Obama no. is the guy. I mean, he that's, is, that's, he's the embodiment of everything that like they, they now stand for and believe in. It's right. It's, ra- it's Barf Sacco Crumbo. It's rap, it's rap Rock's party. I just want to read yes. here a little bit from this interview. You know, he, he's talking to Jeffrey Goldberg and you know, he's going on here and he says, I certainly don't watch reality shows and sometimes I'd miss things that were a phenomenon. But I thought there was a shift there. I write about it to some degree. I actually have great admiration for a lot of those traditions, what you were ascribed to be masculine qualities. When you think about the greatest generation, you think about sacrifice, to which Jeffrey Goldberg says, a colleague of mine says that in some ways you're a never-Trump conservative. Obama, rather than saying, uh, who is this asshole and what the fuck is he talking (laughs) about, says, I understand that. There's this sense of probity, honesty, responsibility, of homespun values that I admire. (sighs) That's the Kansas side of me. My grandmother's a stand-in for that. The folks we celebrated at Normandy, including my Uncle Charlie, who was a member of the units that liberated parts of Buchenwald, those were men who, whatever their limits, whatever their constraints in terms of their emotions, because they were told they couldn't feel, they couldn't and couldn't feel as be seen as men, 
However, their relationship with women was skewed by all this. They sacrificed for others, and they never bragged. And he's going on like this, blah, blah, blah. And then this Goldberg is the fucking says, Tony Soprano model. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, what happened to the what you strong heavily his nose guy. and be like, Gary Cooper? Yeah. <laughs> no, but, okay, so, like, so Goldberg says here, <laughs> you were just surprised by the horse populism wrote in on. And he goes, yes. And it's this indication of parts of the of popular culture that I've missed. So he's saying, like, I've been so busy being president, I've missed these disturbing trends in popular culture. I don't even have a TV. Doesn't Obama write a list every uh, year that he's like, yes. all right, guys, here's my 15 favorite yeah, drinks. Yeah, oh. he's got, like, a fucking Ringer podcast, like, ranking Ozark episodes. Like, this is about what you watch on TV, man. Uh, he's reality fucking television, fucking... that's an oxymoron. <laughs> He's talking to fucking Bill Simmons about like doing the the the, the sweet sixteen bracket of the best wire characters, and he goes, "Uh, yeah. uh let me be clear, uh, brother Muzon uh, would defeat Proposition Joe. Uh, <laughs> one thing uh, I want to be clear about. Um, no, but he goes on here, and he, this is very telling. Here, he says it's interesting. People are writing about the fact that Trump increased his support among black men in the twenty twenty presidential election, oh, and no. and the occasional rapper who supported Trump." <laughs> I have to remind myself that if you listen to rap music, it's all about the bling, the women, the money. A lot of oh. rap videos are using the same measures of what it means to be successful as Donald Trump is. Everything is gold-plated. That insinuates itself and seeps into the culture. And what I love about this is I guess he is out of touch with popular culture because, I mean, he's talking about the rap music of 15 years ago. Like, yeah. if, if Barack Obama... In a, way that, in a way that you would do if you were trying to find common ground with, like, Bill O'Reilly 15 yeah. years ago. Or Bill Cosby. Yeah, yeah. Like, he... Yeah. It, it's like... I mean, first of all, all rap today is done by 19-year-olds <laughs> who have BPD, and it's about having BPD. Yeah, all rap music <laughs> today is about Every, taking... Uh, Rap music today is about taking so many pills you can't feel anything or being a woman who's incredibly horny. <laughs> yeah, that's those are the two things it's about. But I mean, I like it's like it is no one no one voted for Democrats at the rate that black voters voted for, but there was a completely st statistically insignificant amount of black men who voted for Trump and for whatever exit polls say, we don't know why. Maybe it was stimulus, maybe it was something else, who knows? But it's it, it there's instantly this recrimination about how oh it's because they're rapists like donald trump and they only care about bling it's like didn't 80 percent of black men still vote democrat how much is enough how much is enough yeah. for democrats who do nothing for these voters but, yeah this is the most entitled fucking bullshit i have ever if i was someone who voted democrat in every election since 2008 i why would I still, this is how they treat me? But the thing is, is that that's the only response they can have. They have yeah. to break, like, they have to say, we're the Democrats, we're the good people. And then when what's well, like, well, some of these good people aren't being good anymore. It's like, well, that's yes. because they're bad now. And you say, well, that's no way to fucking try to keep your coalition together. The only way they can keep their coalition together is through fucking disciplining and chiding people. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So, like, when things start going bad and someone you see someone drifting away, you yell at them. Yeah, again, because in the absence thinking of that any material politics, back. what you're talking about is, like, it's stylistic. It's like, are yes. you, like, the bombastic guy that's constantly up there, like, talking about his dick and balls? Or are you up there being, like, reading one of those, like, in this house, we do hugs, we do yep. believe science <laughs> posters? Like, that stuff, to me, like, if that's the alternative, like, you're going to lose a lot. Not, yeah. because, not just because you're not offering people stuff, but because it's fucking annoying. It's fucking I totally lame. understand. The, I'm sorry. I understand the appeal. But I, I mean, if you go, why okay, you would want to do it? If if you go on in this Jeffrey Goldberg interview, and I'm not because I don't want to kill myself. But like you know, uh, uh, Barack Obama goes on to critique like sort of Trump's conception of masculinity, and he says it's sort of surprising to me that that Trump is considered sort of like the, the, the you know, like the Gary Cooper character, because, you know, correctly, as we've identified before, I mean, he's possibly the whiniest bitch in human history. Yeah. I mean, like Felix, like you just said, like his tweets now after losing the election are just, I won the election. And then the next tweet is like, if I killed myself, no one would care. <laughs> so, <you> know, <laughs> there'd be a fucking parade if I died right now. Guess I have a headache. Guess I'll Did just you see die. the one where he goes, I hope the future historians remember that all this good COVID news happened under my term. Yeah. <laughs> Don't forget me. <laughs> they, they, got, they made a vaccine under me. Don't, Don't, Don't Donald, forget my spirit. Donald Trump, since the election, his message has been don't abandon me. Are you abandoning me? And uh, I'm cutting my bangs. And I think next semester I'm going to apply to RISD again, even though my ex who gaslighted me about giving me a UTI goes there. Yeah, no, I he's just, like, you follow I him. just took a bunch of pills. 
It's the vac- <laughs> <laughs> It's the vaccines that got small, not me. Yeah. I'm, re- I'm ready That's for my the close idea up. That he's Mr. trying to pad his stats with good COVID yeah, news yeah. is incredible. Like fucking Ricky Davis chasing a triple double <laughs> with eight points by thirty points, <laughs> oh, dude. Like, <laughs> yeah, no, um, but 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 it, but as Obama goes on, he just talks about how you know Trump um, actually is a. Um, uh, you know, is is a, is a is a parody of of traditional masculinity because you know he never he never admits wrong, he never takes responsibility, he never stoically accepts you know uh, re- you know the, nope. the responsibility for the fate of the world and the things that he's done. And my response to that is like, neither do you, asshole. You're out here blaming Little Wayne for why yes! fucking Democrats he can't never fucking did a goddamn thing yeah, wrong. Like, you, you, Every you think, choice you think, he made he, was the right do one. Do you think he would ever say like, gee, maybe I should have bailed out homeowners rather than fucking uh, Goldman Sachs? Hmm. He said, I don't know if that it was that interview or another one he did to promote his book. He said, when asked, you know, why don't you fucking put anyone from Wall Street in prison? He said, well, I, 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 I didn't want to destabilize society, uh, but I'll leave it to. I'll leave it to others to judge whether that was smart or not. Okay, okay, I will. I, I, I'm judging him for that. (laughs) Yeah, we judged. It sucked. uh, sucked. sucked. But but yeah, it sucked, dude. But I think this goes back to what we were saying about the the stylistic differences between Trump and Obama, and and that being what he's responding to here is that for him, it's like when he capitulates or when he does something wrong, it's because he knows he has some reasoning in his head for why it was impossible for him to do anything else. And I think with Trump, there's not ever a reason why he does it beyond what the most obvious one is. And I think that if you're somebody who's dedicated your whole life to this kind of like wised up version of compromising and negotiating with yourself as Obama, as I think a lot of leading Democrats have, you would be offended by this guy, like just openly cutting deals for his buddies or like sending someone a check. So they vote for him or whatever. Like that just seems gauche. And that's not regardless of whether it is or isn't like you have to recognize that it, is real, that it has impacts on people. And that also like not everybody is going to be as impressed with your intellect as you are. Mm -hmm. Like you have to give them something to show them that it's working. You can't just be like, trust me, I've read 100,000 books. You read all the posts. posts. (laughs) (laughs) Just, just watch the wire. Okay. You know, absorb some culture, watch some of my Netflix specials and you will come to understand why it could be no other way. Like Biden, like Obama's post, presidency thing it really is like he got like maybe he did believe in something one time in his life and he got the fucking uh maybe it was right up until the moment he got elected president i don't think so but maybe then he got the fucking uh the ned Beatty speech and it yeah, just cooked his network. brain and he decided yep. well i gotta do this and now i'm gonna spend the rest of my life at, at convincing you all all why i had to do it but, i'm I mean, gonna sit like- i gotta put my cultural tendrils out to massage your brain into thinking there is no other alternative than this but, because but look this at, is but look- a fallen world and this is all we can ha- all we can scram- scramble out of it but looking at it overall about like you know liberals and democrats who are, are very disturbed by the prospect that that trump and his his millions of supporters will essentially never ever believe that this was a legitimate election or accept Joe Biden as president. Well, what the fuck did they do for the last four years other than just obsess over that, like Russia stole the election and that there are active measures and Trump's the, an asset and that Russian hacking actively changed voter rolls in states. And then like, you know, they had their pussy march. And now Trump has had his pussy march this weekend. I mean, yep. obviously, like vastly more, significantly more sparsely yeah. attended than the the original pussy march. With different energy. Yeah, yeah, d- uh, yeah, different energy. You here, mean the but... women's march? <laughs> yeah. You keep calling it the <laughs> pussy march. Yeah, the, the hats were the pussy hats. You're not, sure I don't think they like it when you do that. Though. Yeah, <laughs> the pussy oh, march. Jesus, like, Jesus, man. Oh, Jesus, will yeah, you've got will you got full MGTOW. Yep. Wow. <laughs> yeah, Will Will Corolla. Yeah. You know, they had their pussy march. Hey, yeah. Do you remember the uh, do you remember the 2017 Femoid March? <laughs> hey, you felt you, you fellas you, fell, you fell know what I'm talking about. And hey, come on, man. The MAGA guys are pussies too, okay? And as long as you're talking about pussies, I mean the one thing I, I really will revel in is all of the uh like uh, conservative commentators and TV personalities who are using this moment now to be like um, the hate and mockery that supporters of Donald Trump are feeling right now is really not okay. It's unfair to no. There, uh, there is there is a, lived experience. We we don't even get anything new in this culture because the Trump people are just doing what Democrats did. Like they're yeah. literally making posts where they're like. I have never been more disgusted with Joe Jorgensen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, so like, yep. like 
it's literally the same shit. It's li- when Hillary voters were like, take some time to think about how the women in your life have been murdered. <laughs> uh, like in 2016, like their Trump people are doing that. We just have, we're, we're going to relive the same four events for our entire lives, but just like one year, the fucking uh, conservatives will do it. And then one year liberals will do it. It is yeah. frustrating that they didn't stick with their shit longer too. The idea that like somebody that's got like, like not flags on their boat, because I don't know what people put on boats, but flags on their car. When you reach that level of being like just absolutely Trump brain that you've got like the fucking like somehow don't tread on me, but also the Blue Lives Matter flag flying from the yeah. back of your yeah. F-150. Yeah. Like I'm not uh, owed that that person is not owed like the, some deference while they like remove their flags and replace them with different flags or like, you know, they like take down Blue Lives Matter and put up Ohio State and they're like, well, this is it. This was difficult for me. <laughs> like that, that person's an asshole. Like I'm allowed to laugh yeah. at that shit. Like there's not, it's not like their hopes and dreams were dashed. Their whole thing was that like somebody else would beat someone they don't like up for yeah. them. Yes. And, and I guess like, like now they have to wait a little while before that happens again. Like, I'm sorry about it, but and obviously like, and you know, and they'll get to the complain about it until that happens. And obviously like every outcome that's produced by the American political system is bad and getting worse. But like, you know, all, all these people, like the Republicans who were like, if we allow Joe Biden to win this election, Republicans will literally never win an election again. And it's like, they said that shit about Obama. And then when Trump yep, won, everyone yeah, said yeah. it like the Democrats will never win again. And it's just like, no, it like they'll just, you know, obviously everything will continue to get worse. The system is already vastly, vastly weighted in favor of the right wing and of this country. But it's just like, you know, they're just going to trade off. Everything's going to it's yep. going to be the fucking same. It doesn't like it calm is down. Funnier. When they do the most important election of our lifetime shit, though, it's funnier to me when they do it, when they're like, this is literally good versus evil. Like this fat guy who acts like a Broadway producer <laughs> and like and is awake for 80 hours of time. And then like the guy that wants to declare it National Mustang Day every day. This is the most <laughs> important election that we've ever faced. Yeah, it's like I, I every election for the rest of our lives will be called the most important election. Yeah. Uh, and it's like that stopped working on me when I turned 18, like <laughs> if this was the most important election of our lifetime, why is it Joe Biden? Yes. Right. Why did you give him a, that how, job? How is, how are these the two competitors for this office? If this office means what you say it yeah. does, I can't it does get not make sense, either. sir. It does not yeah. add up. This is the most, this is the most important election in our lifetimes. This is why we've selected a guy who gave himself brain damage in 1963 for combing his hair too hard. <laughs> <laughs> I can't get over it. It's also, it's so reckless. Like the idea of like, if you take it as seriously as that, shouldn't you try a lot harder, not just try harder than Biden, but try harder in terms of like what you're offering people. Like you shouldn't yes. be instantly like, like sort of dampening expectations and like sort of like pre running some recrimination monologues about like who didn't vote for you enough so that you'd have a justification in case you lost. But that's like, because most, but, but, but everything, everything now is outsourced. Everything that we have now, one of the reasons everything is so bad is that everything has been outsourced to the individual or private corporations. Like yep. in the same way that in the same way that like now, if you're down on your luck, if you're underemployed or unemployed, instead of the state taking care of you, you have to get a job with Grubhub or Uber. Uh, it's your responsibility to look after yourself. If yep. you fall through the cracks, yep. the most important election is not a reflection on what the Democrats or if you're a Republican, what the Republicans should have done. It's a reflection on you. Yep. Yeah. It, it, it is more reason for you to accept what they give you. It's outsourced to you. The work of performing the most important election is your job. And that's why after every fucking election now, the liberal media's job is to try to trick all the races into fighting each other yep. over who's the best at voting for Democrats. Yep. Yep. What have you done for us lately? Yeah. It's like the fucking mafia out yep. there. Well, I mean, it, it's because the, because everything has been outsourced, all amelioration of misery has been outsourced. Uh, there can be no, when you're voting, you're not voting to make good things happen. You're only voting to decide who bad things will happen yeah. to. Yeah. Like that's it. And, and so all these, all these things, all these uh, elections do is determine how you're going to get your creepy uh, uh, political uh, uh, voyeuristic thrills the next four yeah, years. Or the aesthetics of how the same, more or less the same bad things are going to happen yeah. in terms of this, like what shape and what tone the compromises yep. that like whittle away at whatever agency and independence you have. And as long as we're talking about, take. 
uh, the fact that, you know, everyone's going to be doing uh, driving for Lyft or uh, delivering groceries or whatever. I mean, how many people mentioned either uh, working on the Biden transition team or whose names have been floated for possible cabinet positions have been directly working for Uber, Lyft or Amazon yeah. over the last oh, four years? Did you see that with uh, with Prop 30 in California that like the guy that was like that ran Uber's communication thing there was like literally the head of the Department of Transportation under Obama? Yeah, he was. A yeah, guy yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and yeah, and um, and like I gotta say though, out of all the names being floated for a Biden cabinet, the one that I am fucking most excited for is fucking Meg Whitman to be Secretary of Hell Commerce. Hell yes. yeah, a fucking Whitman. a Republican, a Republican, a who's, Republican whose but previous yes, but her- job, whose previous job, like a line item on her fucking LinkedIn profile was CEO of QB. Yeah. QB. Well, it's not be, just it, even QB. It was QB. She run ran Hewlett Packard into the ground. And she spent like 10, 13, 30 million dollars of her own money eating shit in a gubernatorial election. Yeah. There's, I, there's I, mean, n- I mean, that means no more Demar- Department of Commerce after that. <laughs> I mean, just like the most the most failing upward loser you could imagine. There's not even in business. It is very difficult to find somebody with that trajectory. Like it's basically college football coaches <laughs> are the only people <laughs> that are allowed to serially fuck up jobs, leave with like massive golden parachutes and then just like get another one. There's like, one other. There's one other. Donald fucking Trump. Maybe yeah, that's yeah. the thinking. It's like yeah. we need our own, and it's the closest we have. Meg Whitman. Oh, it's just <laughs> all the fail with none of the, the success, none right. of the win, yeah. just the yeah. fail parts. I mean, Cal- Meg Whitman is. That's a good insight because what are the the Democrats' only idea is what California is, which is the EU without a safety net. Yeah. 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 Their only designs for the future is a European Union as far as, you know, there will be hate speech laws that, you know, in America that means hate speech is criticizing Israel or insulting cops. Uh, you'll have your favorite you'll have your favorite vape flavors banned. You can't buy soda. Is there a safety net? No. Is there health care? No. Are there labor protections? No. And this is the, the That's really the future. perverse California. thing with this too is that like, I think there's this idea and I mean, I certainly have written about it. Like I've thought about it myself. Like, that the the main threat of the Trump presidency was two institutions. And we need institutions. And I think we do need institutions. But I think that there's also this sense that like what I take away from the four years most is not that like these institutions survived or were destroyed or whatever, but just the extent to which like the rot of them and the way in which either they don't do their job or they've been co-opted to actively do the opposite of what was ostensibly their job. That like those things, they've survived, like in the same way that like the upper tier of like the Democratic Party decision makers have survived, like into their 80s, yeah. still doing the same shit. But that like right. that, like that's more disheartening to me. The idea of like, especially when you look at the way that that Biden sort of codes what he's trying to do in this presidency, it's about undoing and restoring and whatever. And like we wouldn't be here if these institutions worked, first of all. But second of all, like the way that that they work now, the idea of like turning the clock back four years or 10 years or whatever, like it's not enough. Like they haven't worked in so long and it's so clear now that it's very difficult to have faith even in those. Did I stop the conversation? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And do more. I know. I was like, I was just, (laughs) Mm -hmm. I just, uh, I just remembered that um, one of the people on Biden's uh, transition team, who's like vetting things was that woman who, I don't know if you remember this from like a long time ago, but she was one of these like Democratic uh, Party think tank people who went out of her way to defend Elliot Abrams when people were like, oh, uh, yes. yeah, yeah, he, Kelly he, Magsman. Yes. Yeah, Kelly Magsman. Kelly Magsman. She was like, I worked for Elliot Abrams. Uh, yeah, we have our differences, but he's a good man and a patriot. I mean, you're talking about someone who is like personally responsible for unspeakable massacres, massacres. unspeakable yes. Yes. atrocities. So, the best book yeah, yeah. on the massacres that Elliot Abrams oversaw is like 120 pages long. It's so short that I have read it myself. The idea that like you could like it's two New Yorker stories. Like he's not a good man. He might be patriotic, but like you can't look at what that track record is and be like because he was kind to you at Capitol Grill in 2012. <laughs> he's somehow Elliot, something other than the sum of his actions. Elliot Abrams is one of the best cases for the concept of prisons. Yeah. <laughs> not ne- but not necessarily their execution, certainly the concept. Well, there we go, guys. Um, yeah, uh, the Biden administration coming up and the, and the Trump 
anti-Biden administration also going to be very strong. And oh, say, yes. Looking forward to the Avignon uh, Trumpacy. Yeah. And then, you know what? And if you're if you're if you're not happy with Biden as president, you know, and you're and you're 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 venting online about it, I would just I would just suggest that maybe you get out of the intellectual bubble that you've cultivated for the last four years and maybe like understand that this whining, <laughs> all this whining is how you got Joe Biden as president. I can't wait to see the Republican Sarah Cooper. Oh, Republican yeah. Oh, hell yes. That's oh, yeah, all our, yeah. our buddies are coming back. This is going to be very yeah. exciting. The thing that it's, it's going to be an exact copy. Like who's the Republican equivalent to Josh Gad? <laughs> oh God. John uh, Voight. Be, John yeah, Voight. John Voight, John Voight is going to do a front facing video where he's like, hey, it's OK to cry sometimes. <laughs> Robert Davi's doing it, but he's like <laughs> just constantly plugging his new album of standards. <laughs> <laughs> the thing I'm really looking forward to, if it happens, which I don't think it will, is if Trump tries a cable channel. Because yeah, every yeah. time he's tried to make a TV show in the past and it's like it's clear that that's the only thing that he reveres is television yes. and like every yep. time he's done it it's just played like an infomercial for like lawns or like just like <laughs> sort of just like I, la landscaped large properties i want to i want him to make it because like i am a man of many principles but those principles run out when you give me five million dollars <laughs> and uh i would develop shows for the trump network high tier cable dramas and we're talking Ray Donovan, but Ray Donovan is investigating Obamagate. Ooh. That would, everyone would watch that. The, I, I do feel like we're missing out on like Trump coded entertainment. Like that was emerging yeah. as like a parallel space where like Christy Swanson was getting the career she deserved all along. And I yeah. feel like that might be short circuited now. David, I'm just I'm imagining I'm imagining Robert Davi uh, lip syncing to Joe Biden speeches, but then like breaking halfway into it, just just going in and out of lip syncing but Biden speeches and lip syncing Mac the knife. Yeah, it's gonna be very like, <laughs> fly me to the moon. Like he's wearing a hat, but like somehow he's in a Mustang. That's the whole bit. It's hard to tell exactly what he's trying to communicate. <laughs> Well, uh, I think about that. That just about uh, wraps it up for us today. Uh, I want to thank our guest, uh, David Roth. Always a pleasure, David. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me, man. People want more Roth in their life. Where should they go? Uh, Defector dot com. You can subscribe to it. Sorry, you have to subscribe to it, but uh, I promise it's good. And then the Distraction Podcast I do with Drew McGarry. Um, if you want to hear me stammering more, uh, because we record in the morning, I, that's I can't recommend that highly enough. And before we depart for today, we have a, a holiday-themed merch drop coming to you. Chris, speak on it, homie. Yes, we have new merch up at shop.chapotraphouse.com. Uh, this is restocks of a bunch of old stuff and things that I have wanted to get in our shop for a long time, including, finally, baseball caps with the Reaper logo and some very cool enamel pins and new colorways of some of the old shirts uh, that's shop.chapotraphouse.com. And uh, we also wanted to say that we will be donating a portion of the proceeds through the end of the year to various homeless support services in New York and L.A. Uh, so you can know that at least some of your purchase goes to a good cause and not uh, our continued degeneracy. Although some, some of it will be contributing.